our surfboards didn't, didn't arrive. Um, arrive on the plane. Did you uh, Yeah, we gave them claim. the number. Was, is it close? Is there like a close restaurant nearby? Plenty. Plenty. It's, and it's okay to walk at night? Uh, night? No. no. In the day. In the yeah. day. Yeah. yeah. You know how to fight? I'm not thinking about that right now. I'm just thinking about having won the world title and, and hopefully trying to win another one someday. You just drop in and just smack the lip, pull back, drop down, say, bah! Well, I'll tell you, Stu, I did travel some humongous ways. Oh, that's the table thing? Oh, surf looks good on it. Not bad. Ain't that swell with Jed and Vaughn. Oh, those guys are back! <laughs> Get it, Smithy. Far out, man. I can't believe how frothing I am for today's show, man. Because, surf uh, royalty, Rince Corn. Surf royalty, not just royalty. Like one of the great collaborative creative forces in surf history. <laughs> the uh, Scorsese and De Niro of the surf film game, you could say. It's uh, 25 years since their ultimate master. They worked on... I don't know how many projects you guys might have worked on, but anyway, you'll, you'll tell us in a sec. But a, a real, like, unbelievable library through the 90s especially oh. of just insane movies. Like, so important. This was when I was a peak froth, dude. I bet. And I would lie in bed at night, proper, 13, 14 years old, going like this. Please, can I get a wave in a Jack McCoy movie one day? Please, please, please. <laughs> and lie there and just try and manifest it into my life. Um, came close, which we'll get to later, but mate, please welcome to the show on the 25th anniversary of the documentary, Jack McCoy and Mark Ocalupe, bro! Thank Good. you, thank yes. you. Hey. <laughs> Thanks welcome, for your boys. Good to see you. Great to see you guys. Great to see you guys. 25 years, man. I mean, since the documentary, since your world title lock, I mean, I don't know, really, it it doesn't seem like 25 years. Doesn't that feel like it needs a celebration? It needs a celebration. It it's needs time. a celebration. Yeah. And I just figured, shit, man, it'd be great to get this film seen before it was only seen on television sets. Mm. Mm. It would be great to see this film on a big screen. Oh, totally, man. Bring yeah. it back to the cinemas. Give us the full experience. Give a full 100%. experience. And, uh, and I just thought, Gee, and then we found out that it was the the 25th year of your world title. Mm -hmm. It was like, okay, this is a no-brainer, you know? So yeah. we're so excited. I'm pounding the drum. Come on, you guys. Come see Jack and Aki. So let's celebrate Aki's film and his world title together. Yeah. It's a tribe. 100%, man. And celebrate your own contribution <laughs> yeah, to this man's career. Me? No, 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 no. Here's the... This is... This. <laughs> oh, no, don't even, <laughs> don't even start. Man, like, wow, Jack. I mean, I, I, you know, Jack, not just the documentary. That was, you know, obviously the, the pinnacle, but all the movies I worked in with Jack are uh, just, you know, indirectly helping me win my world title. I mean, because... We didn't know what I didn't know what I was doing back then when, you know, Gordon Merchant sent me over to the West and I stayed with Jack and we worked um, on a movie that we didn't know really what it was going to be. But I didn't know that I was making a comeback at that stage. I was just getting fit, trying to get back in front of the camera for for Billabong because they were paying me all those years and that I didn't compete and um, I hardly surfed and and the initial thing was get over to Jack. And um, and start you know training and getting fit and that's how where it, how it started right. That's yeah, that's amazing. Um, let's let's go back to your guys' first meeting. Like when was it? Do you remember the first time you you heard of each other? Because Jack, by the time you guys even started working together, you were already a hit maker. You had surf movies that had sort of really embedded themselves into the culture and been hugely influential. You had Tubular Swirls, 
Storm Riders, Kong's Island, A Day in the Life with Wayne Lynch. These were all massive, massive movies culturally. So where were you at when you first laid eyes on Oak? Do you remember? I do. Uh, it was at a Bell's contest. And, uh, you know, we'd heard about this kid. And, of course, he turned up and you had to take notice. Uh, the fact that he had a fluoro green wetsuit, you know, the first ever fluoro green wetsuit anybody had ever seen in Torquay. And, uh, but it was a real, you know, obvious that there was a talent here. Mm. I followed his career. Um, we had a bit of interaction over the years, not a lot. And then one year in Hawaii around 1989, Gordon Merchant asked me to uh, make some commercials for him. So I was in Hawaii and I made a little commercial with Ock. And then to make a long story short, I went across Pacific met a girl, she fell pregnant, I moved to Western Australia. Um, Gordon had heard that I'd, um, you know, I had a pregnant wife and I was, I was out of a job and um, I'd been a Quicksilver guy forever and they kind of dropped me with Rabbit. And it was a, uh, a tough time for me, really. I didn't know what I was gonna do and Gordon sent me on a trip and I went up to the Northwest. I shot that sequence of Yatha Yindi with all those guys. And then uh, we had such a good time. I came back, showed Gordon the footage. He said, go, let me send you Aki, you know, because I didn't have anything of Aki at the time. So he came up and we went back up to the Northwest. And we, uh, we had a good old time. We had a young guy who was the guy who was with us. Um, Fergie? Uh, Margo. <laughs> Taj. <laughs> okay. Margo. This is this Look, is the was it? it was Kid Bevan. Shane Bevan. Oh, what? <laughs> yeah, wow, Kid Bevan. Bunyip hey. Dreaming. Uh, sorry, uh, uh yeah, Bunyip Dreaming the what all this footage goes up yeah. on to be. So anyway Shane Bevan, yes, we did. Yeah. Classic. But we called him Kid Bevan because he was just this little kid and he had just gotten on the Bill Bunk team. And mm. so Aki and Kid Bevan turn up and you know, we had a great trip. Um, he had a couple of surfboards that weren't that great, but we can talk about that later or some other time. But, um, you know, Ock and I connected really well. Um, and then, you know, I made Bud Dreaming and I sent it over to America with Gordon. He took it straight to Bob Hurley at the trade show they wheeled the VHS player up to their hotel room. They watched Bunyip Dreaming five times. Two in the morning, I get a phone call going, oh my God, McCoy, we don't know, but we can't blah, 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 blah. Go shoot the next one. So man, within a month, I was preparing the trip to take Aki to what was called Aki's Left eventually. Um, back then you weren't allowed to say the word Sumba. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of hoo-ha yeah. about all that. But anyway, um, we ended up going to this resort that a friend of mine was building. It wasn't even complete. It was just really rough. We went there for two weeks. Um, do you remember the flight in there? Oh, it was hectic. No, no, it was it wasn't hectic. We almost died. <laughs> we we <laughs> we flew from Bali <clears throat> to uh, this little strip just about three hours from where the resort was. They had a main airport in Wangapu, but there was this little strip that was supposed to be a little bit closer. So we flew in there, and we had Sunny and Aki w and, and Gordo with us, and my wife and my six-month-old baby boy. And I know a little bit about flying to know that when we were coming in, you could see the wind vane and it was a crosswind. And a crosswind landing is really tricky. And this is a C-130 type of plane. It's got the, the thing that goes in the back, but you're sitting there and there's no curtain between where the captain is and the passengers. You can just look down the aisle and see what's going on. And I'm going, 
this guy should be pointing the plane into the wind a little bit and mm-hmm. come in sideways. And, and about, you know, 10 seconds before we land, I said to my wife, hang on to the kid, because I know we're not coming in right. Mm. And he came in like this, and we bounced and bounced and bounced and went all over the show. It was just a big field. If it was a strip, we would have been all over the place. Mm. And then we finally come, t- it was like life and death, you know? We finally come to a stop, and Gordo goes, nice landing to the captain. <laughs> And the captain turns around, he goes, student pilot. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, and that my. Was, and that was the start of the trip. Anyway, we had a great time in that, that trip. Uh, mm. The gang lasted for two weeks. We didn't get any surf. But Ak and I ended up staying for another three weeks until I knew I could get it. This is before surf reports. And, uh, you know, but we can talk about that later if you want to. Mate. Oh wow! For first impressions of Jack Ock, when you you know you got to that, I don't know if you uh, if he s- sort of stuck out to you when you did that commercial with him all the way back in Hawaii, but certainly going to the northwest with him and and getting those wow. first desert sessions, I know, must I mean, have been crazy. I was in awe, really. I I went to like Storm Riders at the Opera House, and no. I would have been like about twelve. Or thirteen, maybe I don't know. Like, eight, who, who maybe went in with 11. you? Your, your parents? Oh, I went in you? with some mates. You yeah. know, like we caught the train, and or well, my mum could have drove me. I'm not too sure, but maybe it was probably more like mates. We caught the train into the opera, opera house, but I mean, Jack was there, and like I'm like a twelve, year, ten year old kid or something. But anyway, I totally knew, knew who Jack was, and when and when Gordon said we were going to work with him, I was like. You know, Gordon always, you know, he was a perfectionist, just like Jack. Mm. And, you know, he's like, if we're going to make movies, we want the best, you know. And then he grabbed Jack and I knew it was on. And, you know, like, uh, you know, just to go up to the Northwest was amazing all those times, you know. And um, and then Sumba was crazy. Mm. Like, we also, one year, I think it was the same year, we had the house at Sharks Cove. And, um, and uh, we made... We made, uh, was that Green Iguana? Green Iguana. How's my memory? Oh, it's coming back. <laughs> it's coming back. <laughs> hey, look at me. Uh, going, yeah. Is that the Green Iguana? <laughs> but, yeah, I oh, mean, all the, all the movies, all the movies, you know, and just, mm. you know, like it was just, it was amazing. You know, like two completely separate lives for me really you yeah. know being on tour and then being with jack you know um both intense <laughs> but you know like the joy of being with jack and surfing perfect waves you know with no you know no wins or losers you know it was mm. just adventures you know it was probably better <laughs> i don't know like that world title was great but you know we've kind of all culminated all this into one you know and we you know, um, you know, Jack and I have done a talk story tour before and it was very successful. And this is going to be, you know, not a whole lot different because we will talk story over the culmination of me winning in a world title, me winning a world title and, and culminating, you know, like doing the movies, mm. you know, and um, how they both kind of helped each other. And what about Gordon's role in all this? I mean, this is a guy who started flogging uh, boardies out the back of a panel van and you know, he builds this billabong empire and then he's kind enough to, to sponsor you for three years when you're just kind of, you know, going through a, a down patch in life and then he puts you on the, the team and, and glues you guys together. I mean, it's unheard of to think of someone being sponsored for three years without competing or surfing, really. No, no it would not happen like... It's, I mean, it was ruthless back then, but, you know, now it's probably worse, you know what I mean? But I was the luckiest man in surfing for sure. Like, you know, like for Gordon to back me and um, just wait, like, is unbelievable. I mean, it'll, it'll be great to kind of interview Gordon now. I mean, I know he hardly does any at all, but did he envision this? You know, like me and Jack, I know he envisioned me getting fit and making movies and making, you know, making Billabong like the brand that it became, mm. which was insurmountable, like, 
Jack's movies, you know, when the when Bill Bong went through the roof, it had to, you know, it obviously was a major part of that mm. happening. But you know, like me in the world title, I mean, it's another story because I don't know if we need to go there. You know, me asking Gordon if you know I should go back on tour because that's another story in itself. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it, you know, Jack. Can you it was share a major that help. Story of, of well, uh, I mean, I'll share the story because you know, like it was the day um, in Hawaii, like that I um, got invited into the trials, like in some the only kind of outsider that actually got in the trials. I think maybe I don't know ever. There's probably a couple, but I mean, I had those. You know, I was a past winner, and I had a second, <clears> and and um, I was fit again, and. And, uh, and, you know, I don't remember that really how that happened, but I did end up in the trials. And mm. I remember, like, I think I had Liam McNamara at one point pulling the leash. It was, like, huge second and third reef for paddling out there. And he's like, you shouldn't even be in this contest. And I'm trying to <laughs> kick him away. Go and get. And, um, but I ended up, <laughs> I ended up, you know, getting through the trials. And mm. then I drew Sonny, right? And um, it was so oh. much happened that event because I drew Sonny first round and went flat for ages and there's, People going, why is he in the Connors? Why is he against Sonny? Like, you can't beat him. And then I'm like asking Ben Iper, like, what do I do? Because Sonny's the number Sonny, one hope for the world Garcia title. Sonny was, was yeah. aiming for a world title. Yeah, right. and, he, and he's in Hawaii. He's in his, you know, this heat with Aki, who's a wild card. Mm. And it was like a waiting period of like a week. Oh, and I no, remember the like pressure was... You haven't just got Liam pulling your ass, you, uh, no. leggy mate. You've got the whole Liam, lot of... And the trials, like, the trials mate. pumped and then went flat and like all this happened and I'm like, this is way too much. I was going to pull out. Like, you think Neko copped it? Freaking yeah, hell. No. Yeah, you and knocked then, Sonny in that heat. You are oh, done no, for. Get was, off the there, islands, bro. There was threats coming from everywhere. Don't beat Sonny. And I was like, with the threats, I'm like, I don't want to beat Sonny. Like, you kidding me? <laughs> I'm with you guys. <laughs> and then I, I remember talking to Ben Ipa right on Ayukai um, on the bench. And I'm like, Ben, what do I do? And he's like, oh, he's like, oh, you got to surf the heat. Like, Sonny's going to win this world title. He's got to deserve it. You know, you can't lie down. Like, it's going to be the best world title, but you have to. Sonny ended up, you know, and then, I mean, Sonny ended up, when didn't, I beat him, obviously, and it was heavy, but, you know, Sonny gave me a big hug on the beach. Um, I ended up, I'll get back to Sonny, but I ended up getting all the way to the final and Kelly beat me in the final, but, this is why I asked Gordon because that night um, he, we had a house, Gordon was renting a house at Rocky Point and I remember the night I'm like Gordon I was fully fit I was even training with like Joel Fitzgerald at the time he was in Hawaii we were just doing amazing we were just running that beach just pounding that beach and just doing all kinds of floor work and core work and I said Gordon I'm ready I want to uh, you know try and requalify and Gordon said, I don't think it's a good idea. He said, I don't really want you, I don't want you to do it. Like, if you don't make it, it's not going to be a good look. And I'm like, I remember flying home. I was, I remember just going, shit, he doesn't want me to do it, but I really want to do it. What do I do? Got home and I, I just went, I just, you know, I think I, um, you know, Gordon was still paying me quite well. Mm. And I'm like, I'm just doing it. And, like, I don't think Gordon was stoked until I actually qualified, you know what I mean? That ne The next year I just made it back on tour and if I didn't, it probably I would have copped the repercussions. But Mate, just to stop you there, talk us through that process of requalification. Like, you know, that's often overlooked in the trajectory of you coming back and, and winning your world title, getting on the fucking queue after however many years uh, in the doldrums. You know, what was that like? What do you mean oh, was that it period? It was hectic, like... I couldn't believe I pulled it off because, like, it was all fresh faces, like, four-man heats again, and it was I, – I couldn't hassle, and, like, I was riding a longer board. I wouldn't even tell people how long my board was. I, like, it's a rouse. It was, like, one to two foot, and I'm, like, riding a six-five, and, like, I would be hiding the dimensions because, I don't know, I just – was that used to riding longer boards, but I was still getting scores, you know, like – in this day and age, if you rode that, it, like, I dare say it could have even been a 6'8". Like, I mean, I promise you. <laughs> and it was like, Zaraus in Spain. Toomey's boy. Zara <laughs> it might have been. And Zaraus, like, beach break in, well, in the Basque country, just down the line from Mendaka, where Pukas is from. I've got good friends there. I was surfing, like, a, yeah. I was on double back then, but um, I think I was riding a 6'8". It was my favourite board and... 
And like I remember actually guys on tour and I've far I wish you remember the same guy. It was Kaipo Hakis. That's who it was. And he knew it. And he'd be like, I think I had him in some heats and he'd be looking, he's like, he'd be like, six eight <laughs> again. And I'm like <laughs> And I was just like, Don't tell anyone. <laughs> I'll tell you what I find uh, interesting, though, just speaking of Gordon's vision, even if he was sort of trying to shut it down, is that a big part of your comeback was the Billabong Challenge films, which were basically contests made for quality waves. Like, the tour wasn't the dream tour when, you know, this idea first started to pop up. So there's almost this, like, ideal training ground for you to just get your mojo back. And... You're doing it right when uh, Rabbit is, you know, he's pulled into the fold with you guys as well and helping to contest direct that, probably alongside you, Jack, because you would have been calling the shots mostly on terms of what you needed to make those movies, right? So it's funny, like, even if Gordon was saying, I don't think this is a good idea, he's still giving you this perfect leg up where you're surfing against the very best in the world in the best conditions imaginable, and then all of a sudden the Dream Tour turns up and you're... You're primed, mate. You know what? It's sorry. I'll let Jack go, yeah. but never let the truth interfere with a good story. Is his favourite <laughs> saying, and I use it ever everywhere. And I probably shouldn't tell that story where Gordon said I don't think it's a good idea yeah. because it'd make him the smartest man in the world. Because he'd be like, "I knew it. Oh, this is. I was just planning all yeah. this yeah. to get Oki <laughs> back to the top." Right? Yeah, we got nine out of ten. Yeah. Still pretty good. He's Not bad. Definitely Not bad. A, a visionary. But yeah, he so, got one wrong. So good. basically. You know, I'd work with Rip Curl with Storm Riders, and then I had a stint with Quicksilver, and that went a different way. And for about, and around that time, Rabbit got dropped. And I remember that they dropped me. And Rabbit brought Gordon down to see me at Fingal, and we got in his car, and we drove down to the beach. And Rabbit told him all the things that was good about working with me and what we could do for Gordon and, and everything. And he was going, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I never heard from him for two years. And years later, I went, what, what happened then? He said, I didn't believe that you'd finished with Quicksilver. I just had to make sure you weren't in their camp. So anyway, I did Bunyip Dreaming. It was such a success. And from that moment on, Gordon and I worked. We would speak every day for 15 minutes to three hours every day about the marketing. Everybody thought all I did was make the movies. I worked with Gordon on the marketing of that company at a stage when Aki knows that it was just looking like it was going to go off. And one of the key things for me was to, I'd been working in Hollywood, and I'd met a couple of great filmmakers who told me that actors or films that were very successful in the early days always had a moral, and they always had some positive message to get through. So when I came back with Bunyip, there was this big push to say sorry. Sorry was on the political agenda in Australia. And I went, Gordon, it's a no-brainer. You need to acknowledge where the name of your company came from. And so we created Bunyip Dreaming on that behalf. And also at that time, we started to do uh, sponsor Aboriginal surfers. Yes. And we also started doing indigenous surfing contests. So that was the good side. And if you look at all my films, from that point on, there was a moral. There was some sort, you know, the surfer who is sick of sewage is not sick. You know, just those subtle little things that made that difference. Now, when it came to Aki being on the couch, <clears throat> Gordon just called me one night and said, look, I'm about to go into year four with Aki, and I don't know if I want to pay him anymore. What I'd like to do is see if he can spark his interest. 
And uh, he sent him over to the West. I was living with my brother-in-law, his wife, which is my wife's sister, and her four kids. I had two kids. And we were living in this one big house. Then there's a little shed next to it where Aki and we had Andrew Ferguson, the Aboriginal surfer from Coffs Harbor, staying with us. What do you remember about Andrew? Yeah, Fergie, yeah, I just, it was epic, you know. He was such a good surfer and so funny. And um, he, he was real flamboyant, like, in the water. Like, he had a lot of hair and he had a real good whippy snap to him. A uh, real funny guy. I, I loved it. You know, I, I got a, had a couple trips with him and <coughs> Fergie was all time, you know. Like, God bless him, you know. We lost him um, a long time ago now, but... Uh, Still get to kind of see some cousins here and there around Coffs. But, yeah, Fergie was all time. Okay. You know what I remember about him? What? He had the gnarliest snore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Aka would come in in the morning and I could go, I've been up all night. Fergie's been <laughs> snoring, <laughs> driving me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so he came over and we, first thing he'd do, he'd get up and he'd run two miles. And he came back, we gave him the good food, then we'd pack the car and we'd go down. But he was feeling a little bit timid about his appearance. And so I'd say, okay, well, let's go down the beach 200 yards. So I'd pack my camera gear, go down there, and I couldn't shoot a lot of film of him because it wasn't, I didn't think it was going to be that... Well, you weren't going to use it. Oh, yeah. I didn't think I'd use it. I'm glad I did because I got a few shots. And he'd come in and I'd go, go God, you're ripping. Because he was. If you look in the documentary, there's some shots of him at that peak time. And he's ripping. He's going nuts. And I would tell him that. And he said, are you shooting me? And i go, yeah, of course, <laughs> you know. And I'd hike back up the beach with all the gear and go, go on. And then after about, I think it was two months you stayed with us. And then yeah. you went back and you, you started going. And it was at that time when you got serious that Gordon and I were talking about how sick he was of paying for a surf contest that was held at a city beach, the final, you know, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon no matter what the surf was like. No matter what the surf was like. And what a so, visionary he was, Vaughn. So it, w it was a no-brainer to us that s people wanted to do it. Now, because there were, you know, the associations and everything, you couldn't use the best surfers to give Aki his measure. So we decided we were going to have an event with four surfers who had just left the tour. Tom Curran... Tom Carroll and Martin Potter and Aki. And we were All just... young men still. They, like, and, and, and Gordon and I both realized that people still want to see these guys. These are the guys they really want to see. And through unfortunate, you know, circumstances, that didn't happen. But what Gordon did do is he paid $25,000 to have a sanctioned specialty event. And we said, okay, we're going to get the four top surfers in the world at the moment, and we're going to get four wild cards. We had Kelly, Rob, Pally, and Sonny. Yep. And then we had Luke, who twisted his knee, so he went out and Ant-Man came in. There was Margo, Johnny Boy, and Aki. How and that was the first iconic Billabong challenge. And it was the template of everything. Of what it is today. Yeah, mate. <clears throat> I mean, it's really ironic. I mean, because we all just, you know, it was just like it happened, like it um, eventually, you know, spiritually, like there's so many different words you could. Get. I was with Rabbit when he got dropped by Quicksilver. I drove down with him and we stayed together and um, and then, you know, like he came and then I think I mentioned Billabong and it just all happened, uh, what's the word for it? Um, organically. Organically, there you go, that's a big word. Um, but it really did, you know, and then 
it was Rabbit's dream to do the Dream Tour, you mm. know, and while he, you know, was trying to find, you know, new legs and Bill Bong picked him up and then he was kind of coaching us for a little while and then dreamt of the Dream Tour, I faded away, um, you know, and... And then we all met back up, kind of thing, you know. And yeah. Bill Bong challenge, you know what and I mean? Mate, and it, it's so cosmic too, because uh, you talk about you know morals and morality. You know, he's Gordon, right? He he sees so much promise in you as a young bloke. Um, he, he's obviously grown up uh, with your films as well, or, or watched a lot of your films over the years. And then you guys are both on the scrap heap, uh, but he knows the the potential and the, the talent within you both. He, he does all the right things, you know. He, he, he acknowledges First Nations people. He brings together these two supernovas who are, are going through a tough patch in life. And his belief and his vision was so strong that it culminated into something like so unbelievably special that it essentially birthed his brand into what it is today. It's crazy, yeah. It's crazy. All through his kind of his own sense of morals and, and loyalty and, and understanding of the core of surfing, you know, like best surfers, best waves, rabbit as well, obviously in that, uh, you know, kind of triangle of, of or tr holy trinity of core. <laughs> for, 20, for 25 years, Gordon's advertising consisted of one hot surf shot. Yeah. And that was it. Just the best surf shot he could get and stuck it there. And a killer slogan. And, and, only a surfer knows the yeah. feeling. And, mm. and I have nothing but the greatest respect and can only share with people how much this man taught me. You know, like I said, we spoke every day, 15 minutes to three hours about where the company's going. And I would say things like, you know, oh, you know, I heard that. Quicksilver joined and he go, if you talk about the opposition one more time, I'm going to fire you <laughs> because you're not focusing on my company. Mm. I mean, like, what a, what a wake-up <laughs> call that was. You know, it was like, okay, well, and, and then I never thought about him again, you know. I just sort of kept, kept on just doing what I was doing. I just, sorry, mate. I, I, just on that. Um, you know, at the start of the 90s and midway through the 90s, uh, these Billabong films that we're talking about were just the pinnacle. You know, um, all the things we're talking about, the morals and all that, but they had such a sense of adventure, such a sense of fun. You tapped into a side of Oki that everyone fell in love with, you know, that really showcased your personality in ways that people just fully... Ma like, anyone who knew you knew that, that you were just an absolute ball of fun and hilarity to be with. But it really tapped the whole surf world into that. But at the exact same time, Jack, the surf video thing starts going ballistic. And, and kids with video quarters who aren't thinking about um, storylines or morals or anything, they just want to get their clips and get them out there as quickly as possible. That's happening. So even though by the time we get round to Oki's world title and the documentary, there's this monumental comeback going on, what about for you creatively? Because there must have been a period midway through the 90s into the back half of the 90s where you were going, what has happened to surf movies? Like, because it just changed so radically, man. It was like the art form of it, the swimming around for hours and hours trying to get that one clip that meant something to you that you knew you could get. That was just gone. And all of a sudden it was just high impact, throw a rock and roll track on this just thrashy two-foot surf. And that's what everyone in the world just started, suddenly wanted. So was there a period for you where you had to reconnect with what you wanted to do? Let me just back up a little bit to the late 80s. I'd spent three years in Hollywood. And before going there, um, I'd finished Storm Riders and was kind of hanging around the Australian film world. And I'd go to parties and, you know, what do you do? And I go... I do cocaine. What do you do? Industry, industry, uh, people. And, and I go, well, I make, make documentaries. Oh, yeah, that's great. What sort? And I go, I'd make surf movies. And they'd go, huh? Surf movies. Oh, and they'd turn away and walk away because I was not considered a filmmaker. I was considered a surf filmmaker. 
So I went to Hollywood. I spent three years there with a friend doing a bit of work, but also hanging out with great artists, incredible artists. A friend had a celebrity bed and breakfast, and everyone from Jack Nicholson down would come and hang at this house. And the, the lady of the house would say to, like, Eric Idle, hey, Eric, go down and show, you know, uh, David, David Bowie. Go down and show, show Eric and David some of your footage. And Garth and I go down and we show them surf hits. And I'd say, yeah, I got this big heavy camera and I swim out and we're in the jungle and there's tigers and, and there's sharks in the way. And I go out there for three hours and I swim in, I change a roll. I, and they're looking at the footage and they go, God, you're an amazing artist. Mm. And it gave me this confidence that I was a filmmaker, you know? And then I started to think about the movies I'd made. I'd made Tubular Swells and Storm Riders based on my experience growing up with the narrative formula surf movie. And I made those two movies. And Garth and I were working on a little film that ended up being called Surf Hits. And we just made it there in the basement, a little tiny funky project. But it was all talking, uh, no talking, all rocking is what we called it. And it was a template for what Bunyip Dreaming was. And when I came back to Australia and Gordon offered me this job, I knew I had to make a movie that broke out of that mold. Now, here's the timeline of surf movies. And I'm on my little teeny tiny place in that timeline that changed surf movies. Taylor Steele knows his little timeline that he changed surf movies. Now, you're, back to your question, I was, I was kind of frustrated when all those things came out because I'd see Taylor come down to the beach and he'd plant his tripod and he'd stay there all day in one spot. And I'd go, aren't you going to move around and get a different angle? He goes, oh, I don't want to miss anything. And I you know, here's me. I go shoot a couple here, and I wait for a, the guy to paddle back out, and I run down to the next spot, and I get a different... Because I'm an editor, and I'm sitting in the editing room, and I know my audience needs to see something new. You know? But the kids didn't care. No, All they it. wanted was wave after wave after wave with no paddle in, just action, action, action. And really, it's... As I look back on it now... It was a brilliant sort of, you know, effort that went on and a period. And I only wish that it ended sooner. <laughs> 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 only because, only because really today yeah. I want to see, I mean, it's hard for me to watch a lot of movies but today. Man, I mean, it's really tough. Totally, totally. And I think, like, it actually thrills me to hear you say that because um that moment it, those guys didn't choose to just make those that's just what the technology did and everyone took advantage of that and the surfing was super quick and everyone was surfing shit and they liked watching what could be done in that shit so it had its place it just like now you know it's hard to get traction if you're making films because of fucking just every good wave is instantly online or or in the socials and holding on to something and making it precious and crafting it is returning as an art form. Like the five movies I saw this year, man, Calypt, um, the following the fall line, uh, Kamchatka, the, uh, the boys that went to Russia. Like these are beautiful narratives shot world class. With and the they story. They you out so hard. With the man. story. Oh, the narrative is incredible. So. With a story. We're back, Jack. We're That's back, it. man. <laughs> All of my say, favorite surf films have some element of narrative. And, and you know, it's, it's such a, a missed opportunity to go to these places uh, that you travel as a, as a professional surfer and filmmaker and not document some of what's going on around the, the edges, uh, yeah. about the, the athletes themselves. Like, that's it's such a, a waste not to do that. And I, I think of all of my favourite uh, surf films and yeah, a lot of them are yours, Jack, uh, you know, Second Thoughts, uh, that Timmy Turner one, Calypt. Yeah, like these films all have this insane insight into the lives 
uh, the people and the places that they travel to. I think that's essential. Which brings us to the documentary because this is, this is like for many people the pinnacle of, of surf docos, you know. Like it came out at, at a time when, you know, we'd been thrashed for 10 years by momentum and, and all the like and God bless that. I used to lie in bed praying for a wave in those movies as well. But um, yeah, by the time this movie comes out, like, Ock, let's start with you because 99, I mean, you, you've requalified, you've had that performance at the Skins and a three years at Bells that will just never be touched ever. Don't really think you can paddle out there and do anything better. Um, did you start off 99 knowing? Did you have some vibe or intuition that it was going to be your year? Because it, 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 everything was building. 97 skins, winds, bells, 98, full-blown tour, ready to go, 99, with Tahiti, Mundaka, Fiji. Like, yeah, well, it's custom-built for you, bro. It, it was custom-built, like, because um, where I finished my last story was, you know, asking Gordon to, you know, and qualifying that next year, which would have been 97, and I qualified, uh, just made it on. And then, you know, the next year finishing second to Kelly. Like, uh, you know, I won Bells that year in 98 and I had a good year, but Kelly had a really good year. Mm. And then, so it was that next year. And I didn't know, no, because my first result was on at Snapper. I got 33rd. And um, <laughs> Cabarita, Cabarita, yeah, they moved it. Oh, I, I remember that it's one because Bo Emerson, Bo Emerson and Nudes in the final. And I was on the phone, I was actually talking to Bo yesterday, but uh, on the phone, but um, yeah, no, so I did want it to be my year, but after a 33rd, I'm like, oh no, it mightn't be because you know, like, I was probably only dropping you could only drop one result, but. But Bell saved me because I got a third at Bell's and um, I was back. Wait, you could only drop one result out of how many comps were there that year? It was like, like 10, 10 or 11 or, or 11, yeah. Um, Ruthless. Don't, was even 13, don't quote it? me on that. There were 12. There 12. were 12, okay. But um, yeah, so I think we're only <laughs> dropping one, but don't quote me on that. But yeah. it's a good story, right? It's a good story. Uh, it's a good yarn. <laughs> so well, the, you've already got, dropped it first comp of the year, I got so the, I mean. Yeah, I got the yeah. third at Bells and um and then and then I was back, you know, like kind of in that top five picture. And and yeah, it was um what was my next event? The next event <laughs> you got thirty third. No! Oh, <laughs> Where's that at? at the Manly Coke in Sydney. Or, it oh. might have been Narrabeen or Manly. Yeah, yeah no. and it sucked. So I wasn't having a good start at all. No. You know? And so I was not thinking it was my year until um Tahiti. Tahiti, yeah. And, and it was only how big? Well, I mean, in the final, it was only four, three to four foot, but it, it was 10 foot during yeah, the, the, during, the, during the, the early mid, heats in the, were 10 in the foot, yeah. mid, uh, mid rounds. I had uh, a heat with Shane Beshin. It was like eight to 10 feet. I had a heat with Victor Rebass. It was about eight to 10 feet. So I got through, um, you know, Shane Beshin. Obviously, Victor was, probably wasn't as hard a heat as Shane Beshin, but it was a tight heat between me and Shane. Um, I remember a really good big barrel I had in that heat and then another one at, against Victor Rebass and then, and then it was quarters and um, we woke up that day, uh, you know, we were staying at Manoa's house at Papara, um, hanging out a, a, a bit with um, Johnny Boy was around and stuff at the time and um, I remember that was, uh, I think my first year... Oh, anyway, long story short, I think, you know, we, we paddled out and watched the trials. Me and I was staying with Luke Egan and, and uh, you know, that whole year Luke was a big help for me. But, he, you know, we caddied for each other. But we paddled out to Chopu. It was the trials was on. It was huge. And Johnny Boy was on a ski. Nearly ran us over just going, do something. <laughs> and, um, and that was it. And I remember I went on shore for a little while before the final. And I um, didn't have a leash on because we were just paddling out to the channel to watch. Got called off for 15 minutes. I caught a wave, lost my board, broke my board, just pulled through because it was a little onshore, so I didn't know if it was going to open up. West Bowl, pulled through, lost my board, broke my board. That was my start to the whole thing. Um, and then we stayed at Manoa's house. And, uh, you know, and then that very last day, sorry, um, woke up because thinking it was still going to be big, but got to the end of the road and it was dropped. And I was like, wow, rubbing my hands together, kind of. It was four to six foot, pumping. And I was like, oh, this is me. So, you know, got through my quarter. And then by the final, it was dropped. You know, it was like three foot by the final and ended up winning. Who was in the final? Hobgood, one of the Hobgood brothers. Yeah, it was okay. CJ or Damo, I think CJ. 
Um, yeah, but, you know, like then, then I knew because um, I was walking through that, you know, the, the pathway at, uh, at, at Chopu there, you know, it's like beautiful, like kind of like the Hawaii, path, the Hawaii bike track of it, you walk. They call that the Dustin Barker Adriano de Souza Memorial Parkway. I no, and it's like, it's full <laughs> jungle, right? And it's a full tunnel that you walk through. It's beautiful, yeah. but I remember walking through that afternoon and the sun came through and it was like a rainbow, kind of a really weird just sight. I'll never forget that sight. And I was mm. like, this is my year. Yeah. And I got tingles, like really big tingles, you know, when they're that big, I'm like, the tingles were that strong. I'm like, it's my year. And then I went on to win Fiji after that and then Mendaka. You, you took the ratings by 300 points after Tahiti. So you were ahead. Then you went to Japan. Then Fiji. Yeah. That you won. You got ninth in Japan. And then you had a great, you said you had a great board in Fiji. Yeah. Cloudbreak was cooking for that contest, yeah. wasn't Cloudbreak it? Cloudbreak was cooking for that contest, I remember. Like, is but that the year you and Louis had a heat? Me a and Louis had, oh, I think it might have been another year because I remember Louis oh, beat me in a quarter. Right. But um, so it wasn't that year because okay. obviously I won that year. Yeah. Pumping still the year I won, but it ended up again small in the final. Mm. I had Victor Rebus in the final and I had to grind it out against him. It was his conditions because it was two foot. Cloud break. Yeah. I remember just wow, uh, trying to out turn Victor Rebus, which I somehow did. And then, um, so it was uh, Mundaka was a, the other event I won. It was an Unglet Mundaka. Hang on, you're jumping ahead of the story Sorry. here. I need, to, <laughs> I need to go back. It's a lot of comps worth checking in on. This well, my, there were 12. This is my mind right here that I haven't got. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to go back and the check it out. In Jack's check safe it out. So there was, there was, um, J Bay, you got 17th, and then there was the OP that you got 33rd, and you were really depressed. You said in the, in the little story that I made, mm. you said, God, you got like, oh my God. And then you went to Europe and you got second at Lacanau. Just did. what I needed is your quote. Yeah. Just what I needed. Then Hossigor, um, you got 17th. Your lead's now 200. Dwindling. Dwindling. Lowy. Um, what do I got? Taj. Yeah, Lowy, you're... And I, then you went to Mundaka and got first. I did. Mundaka was a... It was a great it was event that was Unglet and Mundaka. So mm. the first few rounds were at Mundaka. They got down to the quarters and they moved us to Mundaka. And uh, I remember that day, epic day. It was pumping. Woke up in a foggy morning, didn't know how big it was. Fog cleared to four to six foot perfect mm. Mundaka. It was as good as it gets. It was a full barrel riding competition till the final where it went a little on shore. I had Hurdy Gilhermy in the final and had to kind of was like a bit of a floater off. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I just watched it the other day. Did you? Yeah, it's sick. It's, uh, it's pretty classic. But, like, I, I can't get over off. by this stage. You know, you've had the tingles <laughs> on the track at Chopes. But Mundaka, just even having it on tour and, like, how many sessions you've had over there over the years. Like, you must have just peeled out from Hosagor or wherever any time that wave looked like breaking. Cause yeah, we did. You had some beautiful sessions yeah. out there. No, a lot of drives from um, yeah. from Hosagor or Lacanau to Mundaka. Every time, you know, it was called off up there. It was howling on shore um, with that, um, you know, with that south wind. And mm. then we'd go down there, yeah. Yeah. And so well, on the morning, is that another one where you wake up going, ho, oh, oh, ho, fog clears? No, yeah. Well, yeah, it was... You know, I'm still, I've still got the tingles from Mendaka, mm. like, for the rest of the year, really. Every yeah. time I woke up every morning at an event because I do, all I had to do was picture that walking through that tunnel in Tahiti yeah. and seeing that rainbow and the light through the, through the trees and, and then I would get the tingles back and then it would set me up for another competitive day mm. where, yeah. Then we go to Brazil. Brazil, that's Brazil. where it all happened. And you're out there and you're in the heat and you come in. And this guy tells you, you know, if Mick Campbell loses this heat, you're going to be world champion. You went, what? You had no idea. 
You had no, no idea. Nah. And nah. then you said you went and hid because you were like. I did. Yeah. You were freaked out and so nervous. And then they've got yep. a shot of him. And he's got this giant coconut that's half filled with coconut water and vodka. <laughs> <laughs> he had I was a straw. So when I asked no. the guy, because you know, like that, there, there's beet cabanas, you know, like that they have so many of them in Brazil. And, you know, you can get beers and, from there. And I got a coconut and I was like, what's the chances he got? Like, I think I saw it. I was like, is that blood going his Yeah. So like, you're just, you, it you in just there. had this crazy wake up call where so you. So no you one just, knew I was like, no. I, no, yeah. And I was hiding and then the cameras kind of found me he and he was nervous. Was he was down. just, it, it, oh, it, was he didn't know what out. to do. Yeah. Oh, I had an epic chat with my mate, uh, Jesse Fain, who was the media manager at yeah, ASP at the time. And he was like, where is he? Where is he? And he just had to find you and hunt you down. And he was there for the moment. But yeah, talk us through that moment as the, as the clock's yeah. ticking down. Oh, well. You know, I just gripped onto that coconut like it was my little safety blanket, you know, like <laughs> um, it's the only thing I had. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> you didn't have any family, kind of, no friends. Yeah, you know, like, ended up with an alcohol problem after that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, well, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> but anyway, you know, it just all culminated and it would just, it started like a big slow motion kind of, you know, um, thing, you know, like. And then, you know, I got lifted up and then... No, no, hang on. Mick Campbell's out there. Yeah. With who was the surfer he was against? Oh, he was against uh, Ryan Montero, I think. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. And yeah, so, so it's like this really super close heat right to the last 30 seconds and Mick's winning and this guy catches a wave and... Beats Mick at the last Goes second. Back. A little bit of juice from the Brazo was... judges. Well played. <laughs> Obrigado. We'll take it. Uh, it was the, I remember the day. It was a cloudy day. And I think there was a couple of people that had to lose, but it all happened that day. Um, but, yeah, uh, and that was it. I mean, you know, the story could go on of how the party started and w when did it end. And um, it was many years after. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but you, um, went, you, you went home, you went to bed. You had to come back the next day did. and have a heat. I did, I did. <laughs> I did have to go to bed the next day. Well, I mean, I <laughs> promise you I was good boy that night, except for the 50 beers that I drank. I mean, you know, so, I mean, nothing else, yeah. I promise, um, <laughs> till later. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to surf and try and win that event, but... You know, Billabong had a party for me. We had all the whole team there and everyone else. And you know, I remember it was at a restaurant. You know, we pulled up some sort of about midnight, but I was not drunk. Mm. I mean, I drunk a lot. And then because of my adrenaline, and my, it was so high that it was not until the next day where I jumped on my board and just like could not paddle. Mm. And I was like, I'm drunk. <laughs> and then I paddled up to Pedersen Rosa. I'll never forget it. And I looked at him. I was like, mate, you're good. You got this heat. I can't surf. I'm still drunk. And he's like, he gave me the biggest stink eye thing. And I was trying to psych him out. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, nah, don't, don't. I'm serious. Like, you got this. And he's like, he's looking at me. Anyway, and then the party started. Yeah. yeah. Mate, how soon after that Hooter went? Did uh, Gordon get on the phone, or were you on the phone to him going, the, we've got a documentary to make here, like we're going to, we need to start flaring. Well, they already made it. It was done. Yeah, and he won the, the movie came out the year before he won his world title. Whoa! So it was like a, a postscript, you know. I got my we ended long with long it, We ended with his skins win, because that to me for me as mm. a filmmaker and as a creator of watching surfing, there was no one surfing any better than Aki in that skin seat. And then the last sequence in the movie is you and Louie having a free surf, which is my thing, the artistic, yeah. no contest, no, you're having this thing. And you finish on those two highs, that to me was high enough. And then he goes out and wins the world title, and the movie's already come out. And I just went, 
oh, he's got unfinished business to go in this new yeah. new production, you know? And so when we did release a DVD, we did cover the world title, yeah. which is where I got all this information. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I probably might be answering your question that you haven't asked yet. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so that was it. I mean, you know, like the question, I don't know if you're going to ask Jack this or me, but this is a question I asked for Jack is, like the DVDs that, you know, we're going to show this movie, right? And um, I'm hoping, or I was thinking that, well, hoping or thinking, I'm not too sure which word is better, but I'm thinking a lot of the audience are younger and they haven't seen this DVD. I mean, where do you get DVDs anymore? I mean, there's Bunyip Dreaming, Green Iguana, the documentary, a lot of... I mean, are people seeing these things? Or like, we're showing the documentary and have, I'm hoping kind of that, I'm ha you know, obviously I want everyone to have seen it already, but I'm thinking there's a big audience out there that haven't seen it. Jack. Well, that's the reason I'm bringing it back because <laughs> there's, you know, there's a lot of people who have heard of it. Uh, a lot of people don't know that I have a, a Vimeo channel, yeah, Green, the Green, Green Room, Room yeah. Movies. Free you plug. can go watch all my movies. Amazing channel, mate. I, yeah, I, I yeah. tap into it a lot. Yeah, yeah but anyway, all my movies are available there, but there's not a lot of people that know about it and whatever. But the thing is, this is a story. The documentary is a story about a guy's life. Mm. You know, in 1999 also, the West Coast Eagles were having a grand final in Sydney. And Mick Malthouse, the coach, because a lot of the a lot of the footy players were surfers, before the grand final he showed them the documentary that inspired them to go on and win a grand final. And so it's an inspira I'd like to feel it's an inspirational story, a good story. You know, as surfers, we love our heroes as they're going up. And when they crash, we kind of feel a bit, you know, sorry and, and bad for them. But God, we love a comeback story. Mm -hmm. And I just want to acknowledge you, Aki, because I know the work that you did I was there. I was right there in the impact zone with you the whole time, man. And mm -hmm. the work that you did to get back was... Come on, you brother. Thanks. <laughs> I owe it all to you. I mean, seriously. <laughs> it's going to be fun. You know, we're going to talk story before the movie comes on. You know, the movie goes for about an hour, 45 uh, minutes. Hour, hour and a quarter. An hour and a quarter. But we'll be there to talk story and, and even answer questions if people want to know things about, you know, how he made it or how we made it and how long it took. Because it was not just the documentary, but a lot of the movies, it's hard work, like sitting and spending all day in the water and having to line up, you know, um, uh, line up the shot with Jack. You know, Jack was so persistent you know, you could never paddle too far away. If it was pumping up the line or something, you're not going up there. You are staying with me, <laughs> lining the shot up. And I started getting good. I started getting good at it. And you know, like, there's a, it's not easy to make these movies. And you know, he's a perfectionist. And and I got brought up doing that and learning how to do that. It's hard. You know, I mean, a lot of free surfers know what I'm talking about. But um, you know, we're going to talk story. Uh, it's like a testimonial year for me, really, because. <laughs> You know, like, I owe so much to Jack and I can't wait to do this. But also Billabong are bringing out an Oki range this year. And it's amazing. And um, so it kind of, well, it's going to be out this year and next year. But it feels like it's going to kind of a, be a testimonial year. And I forgot to ask you, Jack, now we're on camera because I was just at Billabong. It was range release. And the guy's like, how come we're not showing it in New Zealand? He's like, are we going to go show it in New Zealand? And I haven't even asked you that yet. I'm asking that on camera. But um, well, so many people want to see it. No, there. no, we, 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 we launched the, the announced, we announced it yesterday. What? The, the 
tour. Yeah. Okay. It the was dice. announced yeah. yesterday, and all I got was a thousand comments of why aren't you bringing this to the East Coast? Why aren't you coming? To, for why I'm in France. I'm in the UK. Oh, hey, I'm, New Zealand. What are we going on the world? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you back on tour. <laughs> Get on the phone to Gordon, mate. Better Look, make sure he's cool. I just like I just <laughs> like to nice. to back, just share a couple of yeah. quick things with you. When Aki first came with Bunyip Dreaming, the thing that he had was a respect for me, which a lot of surfers that I'd been working with on that first trip didn't get. You know, I'd ask them to do little things, and they go, I'm not doing that, you know. But I'd ask Aki, can you run over here in front of the camera and pop your head up and look both ways? You know, I'd ask him to jump over the camera. I'd ask him to do whatever. And there was not once that he did not get the fact that he didn't know what I was doing or how it would come out, but he trusted me. And the, the next thing that I just wanted to share with everybody was that I'm at the Kira contest. And there's this guy with this knock knee, Mark Richards looking style, who's the most incredible surfer, and he just gets this insane tube ride. And I go up and Rabbit's up in the little shed there, and I'm on the beach with my camera. I go, Rabbit, who the hell is that guy? He goes, his name's Margo, and his rip curl contract comes up in two weeks. I get, oh, good. So I tell Gordon that night, I've just seen this kid, and I really believe he's going to be a great surfer. I could tell right away. And so we get him. And then two months later, I'm with Aki, in the Northwest. And again, Aki turns up with a couple of bogus boards. And so I call up Vince and I say, you got to get some better boards for Aki. And he goes in to Nev's and he gets this really narrow board and he sends it over with Margot. And just before, while we're sitting there ready to go into Carnarvon to pick him up, Ak climbs up on the top of the, the car and he puts his knee through the windscreen. Do you remember that? I think so, yeah. Yeah, so we had to knock the windscreen out. We went to Canar, <laughs> but no windscreen, all the way back. No wind. And we've got this kid, Margo, and we've told the whole camp we've got this new kid, and I don't even know if he can really paddle or not. You know, I, I think he could surf. It's six to eight foot Narlu, and we're all sitting, nobody paddled out. Every, Margo's out there by himself, and he goes up the center peak. He catches the wave. He comes flying down the line. He didn't even know there's a bubble in this thing. And first thing he does is he comes into the bubble, and everyone kind of goes down the step. And Margo just went up and went, bam! <laughs> Landed it and kept going. And I just went... Oh, not a bad talent scout, McCoy. <laughs> but yeah. that was the start. Now, I'd been working with Aki for a whole year on the green iguana, and he had dreadlocks. And he turns up, and he's cut his hair. <laughs> and I'm going, what are you doing to me? Continuity. What's going on? What, what are you doing to me, Ak? I mean, but... <laughs> So I'm sitting in the editing room, and we're trying to figure out what to do with this new look of Aki. So I said, why don't we just make it like he's another person? Let's call it Aki's brother, Rocky. And so we made up this thing, and Gravy and I love making the movies at that day, like, molto terra, you know, we just tried to pretend to talk Italian or whatever. And then when I made the documentary, I wanted to keep that little connection going. And I don't know if you remember, but there's a little Arrivederci Rocky at the end of the film. Now, that was our, our Maldives trip. Do you want to tell them about that Maldives trip? Oh, no, well, not everything about it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a wild trip. Um, yeah, Margo, uh, past the point. Yeah, when he says little... wild, what it was is the weather was crazy. Oh, the weather, yeah. The weather was, was absolutely nuts. And it was cyclonic, but it would 
blow and be, you know, 100 miles an hour. And then the eye of the storm would come and it'd settle down and we'd run out and we'd go surfing for 20 minutes and then we'd come back. And all those little skits were done. My favorite one is Margot promised me perfect pits. It was the pits, all right. <laughs> well, Jack, you know, it was so hard working with Jack and like, you know, because he was a perfectionist, like I say, but if, he, want, if he, he wanted you to do something like that as a skit or something, he's like, you're not saying no, because unless you're out, you know, like, <laughs> and like, I would just learn, like, just, I'd do it, anything he said, not once, maybe twice, maybe three times, you make sure you nail it, right? I mean, it's a no-brainer, because you want to make a good movie, right? And you've got to do what the filmer or the director's telling you. You know, that's a no-brainer, but yeah. <laughs> Talk to us about uh, Ox surfing, Jack. Obviously, he blows up on the scene at Bells. This is the first time you lay eyes on him. And at that point, you know, he's, he's said to be doing the greatest backside surfing ever at Bells, at J-Bay. You know, what stuck out to you with your cinematographer's eye you know, about the lines he was drawing, about his technique? You really want to know? I'll tell you. I love his bottom turns. You know, I have a picture of him at Haleiwa. Uh, this was the year we were surfing uh, during the winter in, in the North Shore. And he and I would get up in the morning, we'd go look at sunset. And he hadn't surfed much at Haleiwa. And I'd see it's a little bit wobbly, Growing up in Hawaii, I knew where the, the good chance of a wave was. So I promised him a breakfast afterward at Cafe Haleiwa if we went down to go check Haleiwa. And we go down there, and there's about six guys out. And it's big. And he's got a Morris Cole, what was it? Like a 7 O's? No, no, no. 7-6. Seven, six. No, seven, like, six it, was it was more like 8-3 or something. No, I, rem I remember the shot because you got, was it a shot? Did you? We taking photos. How we, did we get the shot? We. we <laughs> Cause it was so I would, shot. back then I would film and then I would shoot a few stills. Yeah, that's right. But I, I, and, and the surfing he does, might I'm pretty sure it's an eight, eight <laughs> foot board, because there's a shot I also took from the water view at sunset, and you can see how big it is. But yeah. anyway, it's one of Morris's reverse V's, mm. and. This bottom turn he does that I have a shot, the, the rail is in the water like BK. You know, he was BK backside for me. No, and I, Yeah, you, you, you have those little stocky legs of yours <laughs> or stumps that stumps. Your, 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 your bottom turns are legendary, brother. And I... Thank you for all the years you've shared them with me. Yeah, man, that's a that's an awesome insight too, and a good lesson for the groms, mate. Yeah, Starts it, off the bottom, bruh. Inimitable technique. <laughs> it, it must have been mind blowing to see it come from you know the, the, the sludge of Kernel and just like like a what is it a lotus growing out of the sludge. Like it, it's inimitable. It's ahead of its time. It must have been completely mind melting for the surfing establishment at that time. What what surfer do you know today who does bottom turns? On a that couple, level, but none like that. Mm. <laughs> it's a tough one. Yeah, Dane Reynolds maybe has that kind of year, you know? <laughs> thick drive. Like that's the only surfer I can think of with the drive factor that you've got. Not the same style, but definitely it's sort of a raw edge to it. That's backed with this sort of I don't know. It's a technique that doesn't really come from a a school or a training space. It's like an emotional yeah. response to what's going on rather than a, I don't know, a technique thing. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's funny, bizarre, you know, when you, sorry to interrupt you, but talk technique because I mean, I reckon you're down there doing bottom turns a lot longer than you're up the top, you know, cause mm. up the top, you're not up there for long. So you're pr probably spending more time down the bottom of the wave, you know, assessing where you're going rather than, at the top, you know, like that high line kind of thing. You're up there looking, but uh, the bottom turn, it's all about the bottom turn. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -mm. And I guess like your signature turn front side is that crazy power gouge hook thing. And then it's kind of the same turn on, on, on your backside, isn't it? Well, it's really good question, 
Jed, because we're sitting right behind that, right? I mean, there's <laughs> Ethan doing a carve right there and there's me doing this <laughs> backside turn. It's probably my favourite turn, but didn't get me through a lot of heats, I tell you, <laughs> on tour. It probably never got me through any hard heats. Um, really hard turn to do, but it's lateral for sure. I get that. But... Um, if you're doing it forehand, you're going earning pretty big points. Yeah. But well, backhand, well titled, no. Yeah, isn't that interesting? And it's a funny one. Yeah. So just something to think about. Call the police. <laughs> Call the police. Call the cops. Boys, uh, I've actually, uh, you know, documentary, I think by the time it came out, I was already editing Waves magazine. So, yeah, I was at Waves and uh, I got the opportunity to come around to your little... Uh, editing suite and have a look at it. I can't remember if my name's in the credits. Fuck, I hope it is, but I don't think it is. <laughs> but, uh, well, that's, that would have been as close to getting a wave in it. But I do have like a Forrest Gump movie from the documentary, Smithy, where there's a free surfing session. Uh, Luke Egan and Ock, secret left-hander, which everyone talked about for years after trying to peg it because uh, East Coast lefts that are that grindy and thick don't turn up all that often. Um, so I got to share a session that is in the documentary, a pretty famous one, and... Um, Mate, for me, uh, you know, fuck, it, it was it was beyond a dream come true, man. Like it, it was to be surfing with you and Louis. Pauline Mensa was out there that day as well, which is just so so sick. You know, the Queen, we love Pauline. But um, yeah, I, I don't really know what else to say other than like the point of that was just like it was like my my surf film fantasies that I tried to manifest a million times. I was literally in the frame of what ended up being one of the, if not the best. Oki and Jack McCoy collab, dude. So well, let's hear it for the camera. Swimming out of the. You oh, well you're known. Not to he say finally it, named it. Oh, Twenty five oh, years he's later. Dropped the ball. All Which is what? <laughs> We're all in trouble, <laughs> mate. Oh. No, nah, look, we'll, we'll bleep that for beep. you, mate. Yeah, but <laughs> seriously, that bar, hectic action out there. Tony you Cooper's wanna... been done out there by a little bully. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I'm, I'm serious, you know. I lived at Fingal, yeah. and I have pictures of feeding frenzies of 30 sharks five feet off the beach. And the, <laughs> the time was like Shark City, mm. right? Okay, so can you just bleep that then? If, I'll bleep if, it, if, mate. But, uh, okay. a, ma a, ma a memorable session to share with you guys and a, a real pleasure Thanks. and a privilege. And Thanks, Vaughn, because I, I remember. I remember your little face. You know, you're so cute. <laughs> just going, what? And I remember... That was a beautiful sunny day. Oh, it was magic. Perfect. No, that's no, that, no, that, no that's We travelled all the way down the coast that day looking for waves, found mm -hmm. nothing. It was incredible. And we scored that on the way back, right? Yeah. We did. That was well, my I, memory. I, I knew I knew I knew I knew I I I'd lived at Fingal, but MP and I used to surf between and mm. um and so I had that bit of coast pretty dialed. But I just want to say about him remembering you, that's one of those never let the truth interfere with the good story <laughs> stories. <laughs> well, mate, um, the, the other memory I've got from that day, which is like I'm already sort of tripping out enough, but I'm on the inside for the, the best set that comes in that day, like by far. It was the, it's in the film. Uh, it's a long drainer that you just go sick, sick, you know, chamber after chamber. That way. Until it closes out on you. I don't think you doggy door it, Mundaka but it's in the film. And uh, I was on the inside for that, and I just remember looking. I turn around, I'm looking at you, and Jack's in the spot, and I could just feel all the pressure. You, you were like, like, your body language was so good. Your eyes were popping out of your head, and I just went, go off, go, mate. And I was just like, you know. Again, just one, one of those memories that, like, you watch the film and maybe I only know that story, but now I've fucking told everyone, obviously. But, uh, yeah, just such good memories, man. And fuck. I don't, fuck, I, mate. I don't know what to tell you. It's the best pit in the section. It is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you could have just travelled one section, got clamped, and it would just be an unmemorable oh. section. But <laughs> you gave it to the man. You can't do makes that. makes the cut. that. <laughs> no, nah, mate. Throw nah. him under the Vaughn would have. Nah, all good. good. But, hey, um, so... Jack, the film's been completely remastered, right? It's gone through the, the, the big digital redux. What's sort of different about the movie now that you've watched it with that whole wash going over it? Has it taken it's on just, a new... It's just the opportunity to see it on a big screen. Epic. That's all it is. Sick! I you love that surf films um, on the big screen. We're still debating whether we should show it original 
four by three or sixteen by nine. Mm. We're still. You know what, mate? It actually won't matter because, like you said earlier, this is a story that it, it's bigger than surfing. It's a, it's a story about a life. It's a story about two lives. You know, it's it's both your guys' journey together. It's a story. And man, there's no way even revisiting it now in preparation for this, you get the full blown, you know, fist. It feels like you've won a grand final when you get to the end of this film. And the world title's not even there, which is full credit to what you were saying before. It's a, it's a story about life, but it's a story about surfing. And the comp results and all that, at the end of the day, they're just the cherries on top, man. They are. And the soundtrack. You can't forget the oh, soundtrack. Like, I mean... How good Jack, is it? Yeah. And we're going to be turning that up. Like, <laughs> so, pump up the volume. Pump up the pump volume. Up the you volume. know, like, if you like the Foo Fighters and, oh, my goodness, um, <clears throat> yeah... It's going to be epic, you know, it'll be, I can't wait, you know, just to uh, share the stage with Jack and then watch everyone's face, you know, uh, watching the movie and hopefully, you know, there's, you know, the old school people that want to see it in, you know, in on big screen and then maybe younger kids or people that haven't seen it just want to you gotta get it. to see it. Cause, uh, Tickets, at Jack. Tickets at jackmccoy.com. Tickets at jackmccoy.com. Perfect. But get them screen. now. Get the them dates, in the Yeah, dance. and the dates are probably going to be up on your screen too, I guess. Yeah, yeah we'll whack them on the screen. Yeah. Here they are. <laughs> oh, they're there. No, no, no. That, that, um, but, yeah, if you really want to see it, space is limited. Some of the places we weren't able to get big venues. Um, some are like 250, 300 people. So if you're serious, buy your tickets now. Buy them in yep. advance. Unreal. Boys, have an epic time touring the documentary around. Uh, have a great testimonial year, Ock. If it's, uh, even if it's unofficial, I'll, I'll get on board. Thanks. Swellians are always on board with Thanks you, Thanks for all. No, thanks, Jed. And Jack. Appreciate so it. So good to have you on the Swellians, cricket bro. Match, like that. Celebrity football match for your oh, testimonial. Yes. Celebrity surf comp, something. <laughs> and how good Honestly, is it to have the icon himself again. finally oh, dude. on the show? Jack McCoy, thanks, mate. As good as it gets on your jackass. Oh, mad.